had really a we had really a focus uh, on understanding how can we build these crypto economic incentives into the into the social realm at this time. Uh, for this work, there were some honor, honorable uh, mentions in, in, in Primavera de Filippi's book and also in Radical Markets uh, by Glenn Wild, uh, especially the time we thought we might include things also for governance like quadratic voting and, and all these things that were at the time early concepts were thought that could also revolutionize the way that we are operating. But what then happened is that we chose an entirely a radically different path. And that is, um, we then decided to, for various reasons that I'm happy to just tell you in a second, to abandon this early experiment and work on a new direction. And this is the Akasha World Framework, uh, or now we just call it the Akasha Framework, which is um, um, basically a set of uh, tools and designs and a design system and also um, uh, packages for developers to build and deploy uh, decentralized social networks that are that are operating on this stack that we are providing. Um, in this stack, before I show you how the UI looks, uh, we are deliberately, first of all, not um, relying anymore on on-chain interactions. Um, because of the obvious cost reasons, this would become uh, impossible to, to sustain uh, and uh, for, for anyone participating. And the second thing is, uh, both for token-based governance um, as well as any other token-based incentives, we became quite, uh, you know, rejective of that at the moment. We we are open that this can be something others are introducing back into this framework where needed and uh, where desired, but it is not part of this initial version that we are now having. And um, just about us as an organization, uh, the Akasha Foundation is a nonprofit uh, organization uh, based, we call it, at the intersection of blockchain and in the, uh, the collective intelligence. Um, uh, we build a software framework, um, and also we are very interested in, in uh, accompanying the software with a legal framework, so that when you are deploying such a social network, you are doing it in a way as a, as a DAO, probably, but we felt also the need to make this DAO be footed in, um, in, the, in the legacy legal system, if people chose so to do so. And for this, we were exploring a Swiss association model. Um, and then um, we have a, the first instance uh, that is called Ethereum world. So you can go to akasha.ethereum.world at the moment, not. Because <laughs> there's a problem that is uh, it's a little bit of a technical issue. <laughs> it's uh, it's actually uh, it's not entirely on our side. It's we are we are using textile and they having issues with their Cloudflare services and some some geolocations are blocked and they are they are working on that. Um, yeah, and this is though, if you were joining uh, Ethereum world, this is the, the version that has evolved in the meantime, but this is how the first application looks like, which is a microblogging format again, yet again. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a little bit like a, like a, a Twitter uh, UI, if you want, uh, where you can um, share messages um, and have little conversations on that. But this is just the beginning. We are we are planning to in, involve, and we have already in the version that I would have loved to show you today, um, a sidebar, and, and we are uh, very much interested that, that people are able to develop their own integrations for this, and so to extend the functionality. So there is a feed, there is some kind of an aggregator of, of sorts where, where people can exchange messages, um, but then there's also the ability to, to extend the functionality in a very modular way. Um, and and uh, to yeah to make it like uh, useful beyond just a microblogging application, you know. Yeah, I think that's um, I'm. I think we are. I, I let me just show, share with this with you. So we 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 are looking at social networks, and we have a very black and white. Everything is bad, and then everything will be good view on that, uh, maybe a bit provocative on that side. So 
uh, we we see that uh, today Web two the design domain of uh, web of social networks is, is based on technology. We wish that in Web three it is a socio technology. That also, as we said, interviews really the the communities being able to take their own decisions, have governance over this, have control over their data. Um, we are seeing Alice as not being used by or a user of the application, but we call these, these people participants. Uh, we want that there are members. So that's why especially we like the models of the Swiss Association as a DAA, you know, there's this decentralized autonomous associations. I believe personally that the idea that a DAO is kind of like an association is in general a very nice thing. Associations have been there for a long time and we don't have to reinvent everything. They are also nice because they are not necessarily uh, requiring you to have a financial involvement, you know, which in the DAO or when you have it as a co-op or as an LLC or so, so far, you always have some financial ties to it. The association makes it, you know, if their membership fee is zero, then this membership fee is zero, you still can be a member. You can be legally protected by being a member of the association. And that's, the, that's why we would favor this, this model. Uh, we want to be people be empowered by it instead of monetizing them, as it's the case uh, in the uh, Web two world. Um, Philip, plateau of I speak, intensity. If you want. I can speak to I can speak to the plateau of intensity. Uh, it's explained by uh, Robert Shaw in this 2015 paper, but it's continental philosophy from Deleuze and Gautari, uh, effectively uh, saying that if you want to uh, avoid violence then just keeping everything stable is unrealistic. Equally, you don't want to bring it to a boil, but you need this kind of simmer. You need a plateau of intensity so that tension can be expressed and released continuously in the ecosystem. So that's, that's, then that's quite different to, to control, which is more um, pretending that you can keep a complex uh, evolving system in a constant equilibrium. Well, thank you, Philip. <laughs> um, yeah, and then we have data agency, which which we want to give back to the to the uh, creator, or the member, uh, or participant of the social network, and not uh, it being in the hand of the platform owner, which is really one a wonderful thing of Web three that we can achieve, um, and that allows a lot of interesting you know things of in terms of federation and so on that we might want to discuss. Um, and finally, the, um, the Web3 social networks should be open while they might be for economic reasons in the Web2 world closed, thinking of social graph again, data exploitation of the information that people are storing there. And yeah, the topology would be decentralized. Um, oh, there's another one. Um, yeah, the UI is agnostic. So basically you can imagine that on top of those data, for example, that are owned by the individuals uh, or that are the, having agency, they're not owned, but the agency lies with the individual uh, Alice. Uh, uh, you, you can build different UIs to it and the business model might be a value adding one. We, we got critique for this. We said like, people said like, look, this is like, making it look like everything is uh, totally uh, much better. And, and, and But anyways, it's, it's maybe a bit provocative, but this is maybe the, the dream of where we might want to get. Uh, and not everything needs to be better, but I, I believe there are some aspects of it that, that uh, are worth to explore, you know. Um, and then, Philip, we added this, uh, help me here. So this was a... Yeah, this little diagram here is from Dave Gray, Gaping Void, and it just talks about progression through data information, knowledge, uh, through to insight, wisdom, and ultimately, of course, impact, because Akasha, Kernel, some elements of the Web3 broader community are interested in improving the world, in improving cooperation amongst our species and with other species for a regenerative planet. So that is ultimately the value adding in our, in quotes, business model. It's more of a, uh, a flow, an information flow, a value flow in an ecological sense than a, 
a two-sided marketplace where your attention is farmed in order to be pimped to advertisers. So the distinction between those two columns is enormous. Great. I have a last slide. I think then I stop so that we can go back to this. But just as a nice talking point, and be, be, before we dive deeply into this legal aspect, which which we uh, presented in that deck here, uh, we we first of all here is uh, from uh, Paul Pangaro, which we we explored a lot, and we really are very fascinated about this conversational theory of uh, Gordon Pask, um, the way how you know, people interact and how knowledge transactions happen through conversation and how different, you know, ideas are emerging when people are uh, con conversing with each other. Um, we use that here as a segue to, um, and it has many other different implications, this, this, this figure and the whole work of Paul Bangaro, but we, we wanted to also highlight here that we believe that we need to um, merge the technical code and also the legal code in a way that is when we are deploying uh, such a decentralized social network as the Akasha framework allows you to do, that, that you are always keeping in mind that there is there's, there's not only that technology and that um, that is created by, 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 by a company or by a team of developers and then people are simply um, you know, exposed to it and using it, the people need to also be part of the evolution of that and need to be able to, to be part of the governance, the decision making. Um, and that's what we understand as uh, maybe a, a nice, uh, the, um, the word that you used, uh, um, communities of care, you know, that is what we are intending to create here. And it might not scale to billions of people, but we believe that this might be smaller units of uh, maybe a hundred, maybe a thousand members of such a decentralized social community that are then though also part of many other communities. And, and that's something I want to bring also here to this group that is the idea that, that, uh, that I'm thinking a lot about is how do we also make sure that we can be uh, interoperable with many other these initiatives that we are observing right now that are happening. It's very sad to know that we are facing a, a, the big centralized social networks and there are so many small great projects happening, uh, yet each of them maybe just tries to, to be the competitor in the red ocean against the big one. And we, we should look at this different and take it as an opportunity to ask ourselves, how can we interoperate, federate with each other become compatible in a way. Um, that's one of the things that I would be also very interested to you know, take into this conversation with you guys um, over time. And I would feel that Kernel is a great place to do this because many cool people are coming together that have overlapping ideas, bring new facets to it and so on. Is that, I mean, this slide alone for me resonates with my understanding is relatively new to the Kernel community. It, it, it is the interface between Akasha and Kernel because it describes participant A and participant B interfacing through conversation based on Pask, Pask's conversational theory, which itself is a cybernetic framework, which has been described as trying to understand the basis for knowing that it's the formation of knowledge, which again is integral to Kernel's mission as far as I understand it. Um, so okay. we, we, we were just fascinated by that augmentation of halonic, heterarchical, can I get another long word in there that isn't used very often, I don't know. Um, but we're just, we're just fascinated about those natural qualities. We're very biomimetic in our, uh, our um, design aspirations. Thank you so much. It's really wonderful to hear all of this and have some of the context set so beautifully. I have, a, a, as always, an endless list of questions. But first, I just want to invite anybody else, if you have initial reactions, responses, or questions for Philip Mitko and Martin, uh, please, the floor is yours.
there's a couple of questions I saw also in the chat and um, yeah, I, I, I can, uh, let me share that with you. There is a, for this course, we decided to have a, have a notion page. That's this one, right? Uh, yeah. So I will, um, on the, on the toggle of this date, I will update, I will also put the PDF of those slides, which by the way, that Mitko already told me, they are definitely worthy an update. You know, we, we are not, we are not the pros here, guys. We, we just uh, came in here um, and we did not polish this for you guys. So there are new things we will. Well, we, we were delighted because we know the Metagov people and uh, they're also around somewhere in the swirl that is kernel stack and so it's wonderful to have further context provided there i thought like one of the initial thoughts that i have uh just in relation even to your first slide but something as always that philip said really sparked it in my mind which is this notion of uh, uh <laughs> pretending to control complex evolving dynamic systems that are far from equilibrium as uh, you know we were talking about the other day life itself is a far from equilibrium thermodynamic system the whole point is to keep it that way when that's the death definition of life. Yeah. That's, that's death right it's very funny and the reason that I say that is because the way that you define viable on the first side is like a very interesting choice for me right because the word itself comes from the Latin vita right, like meaning life, meaning living. So this notion of like an independence, an entity capable of independent existence is like an interesting one for me, particularly given the context of this discussion that like, you know, like a lot of the work that has come out of kernel, for instance, like the declaration of interdependence <laughs> uh, and, and a lot of this discussion about interface and federation, I think might, it, it's just something that occurs to me in terms of how you frame this notion of viable social communities, right? It's like, it's not really maybe independent existence, but interdependence. And the reason that I say that and, and link it to life and vita and viable is that in the context of gift giving, which is really what links disparate communities either geographically or across time together if you look at the cooler network of circulating necklaces and arm beads or these kinds of things uh it's always about the liveliness of the gift right if you read like lewis hyde's work it's, it's, there's this deep appreciation for liveliness and the spirit of the gift which is actually what is honored in each giving and taking right that like it's not necessarily about the exact content of the gift or the exact giver and recipient, although those play a role in setting the context, there is like this deeper and like essentially human moments that is occurring where the like honor is given to the spirit of the gift. And that's why like Lewis Hyde is always saying like people are always asking him like, what are we supposed to do with all of this knowledge about gift giving? It's like, it's not about doing anything with it. It's just to be aware that there is such a thing as the spirit of the gift is already enough. And I, yeah, so like, it's like viable, vita, liveliness, and interdependence is all like linked in my mind and it plays a role in federation. But I know Charles has a hand up and come back. Oh, thank you. No, I'm just soaking it up. Um, liveliness, interdependence, aliveness. Um, is a term actually Tom Atley likes to use. And so I just, just to try to efficiently weave. Um, and something I already got into um, on our first call in several years with Philip uh, a couple of weeks back. And Andy, you've heard me, um, and probably Coco as well, and others, uh, more and more, I, I'm on this riff of sort of banging the drum, as you had said earlier, Andy, about wisdom, collective wisdom. And so I just wanted to kind of throw an open prompt to, I guess, you know, the, the Kasha folks in, in particular, but anyone in general, um, collective intelligence. I'm, I'm, to put it lightly, really down on collective intelligence in itself, and essentially because it's not grounded necessarily in ethics, in, in, in wholeness, in this, in this definition of wisdom of, of Tom Atlee, um around wholeness and, and so so yeah what about that and 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 why not just already change it to collective wisdom okay 
that, that was, uh, the two very thoughtful um, challenges. I can try to respond. I don't aspire to respond in whole because I think they're, they're, they're beautiful challenges in so much as there's opportunities to learn from there and, and adapt. Uh, the interesting thing about the Stafford Beer quote is that Stafford Beer uh, approached viable systems from a cybernetics perspective. Cybernetics has been described as the anti-discipline because it's so broadly applicable to all disciplines. And it uh, could also, uh, is in, it is inseparable from the idea of holons. So when Stafford Beer conceives of a viable system, he knows that that viable system is necessarily alongside and within larger viable systems. So for example, a car may be autonomous, except of course we know that if it runs out of power, it's not gonna do anything. So it's dependent on a power grid providing power so that the battery can be charged and now the car is autonomous. So there is that, there is a dependency at lower levels of, should we call it intelligence or a, a lower level in the, in the, um, the principles of, of the way in which it guides itself and and exists. The, 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 the phrase by the, perhaps that Stafford Beer uses that is preferable to independent existence is probably when a system is capable of reproducing itself. That is probably a more exacting and enticing definition of, of, of viability that may begin to interweave, Andy, with, with your, with your um, observation, I think. Quick, when it comes to time. when it comes to say yeah please oh, I'm sorry just just because um, when a system is capable of reproducing itself how is that what's the relation or correlation with with being aware of itself please uh, consciousness is not is way above my pay grade Charles I have to say I'm not even going to be drawn on that one I, I'm happy. That question should be asked to everybody on the call because I'm sure there's somebody here <laughs> who, who, who can do a better job of responding to, to that one than me. Uh, but I was going to come back to your question about intelligence and wisdom. We, one of the things that we understood as we originally framed our mission as we had done at the end of last year as, as this intersection of collective intelligence and blockchain is that uh, it, it didn't give us the communication efficiency that we were looking for in so much as it was difficult to pin down exactly what we meant by collective intelligence and necessarily and, and our necess the necessity of us having to do that didn't really take our mission further forward. So we now prefer to talk about ourselves as interested in developing systems, which again applies to the IT sense of the word, but also systems in general, in order to develop freedom of mind and, and human connection because they they are the preconditions if you like for communication knowledge intelligence and, and wisdom perhaps we don't need to engineer for those at that level if we can get some of the fundamentals right lower down in the dare i say the stack without being too um, mechanical about it what do you think i just uh, yeah um it still could be weaponized, but go ahead, Andreas. <laughs> yeah, um, there's so much to be said, but um, maybe for a start, um, there is also a Akasha Hub in Barcelona, and uh, I really like that. And I really like that um, that Martin put the emphasis on on the association, which is. Uh, in the web free space, people are so focused on technology and by, <laughs> and like, for example, but what, what is the scope of this technology, right? Is it, is it the computer you're sitting in front of? Is it uh, the monitor you're looking at? Is it the keyboard uh, you're typing things in or the mouse, the mouse which you are pointing to things? Um, so I think when we, Talk, uh, say or talk about uh, free is um, for us a way to better, yeah, to better explore our human relationship with technology. Then I think um, technology is uh, really much more broad term. 
and um, uh, which involves like, yeah, of course, doing, creating digital products um, to coordinate people together bet in a better way, but also like this outreach into existing systems. Um, what Andy said about interfaces, interfacing with the existing legal system or interfacing with like um, existing cultural structures like a city like Barcelona. And um, I think this is so important in the space that um, there are projects who are really reaching out of this, like we are only creating a product and we are trying to find users for the product, but um, really thinking deeply and in an engaging way about what does it mean to try, yeah, to improve on technology. Ich yeah. telefoniere. I'm done. I'm <laughs> done. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Andrea. <laughs> I like this, what you said, Andreas, and, and you see that the, all these th things are there. So this is, this is true. We, we also, let's not go into this, but the whole idea of the holons and the, the way that the, 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 we also are having, exploring the idea of having these local and digital spaces merge. We wanted to, or we, we are very interested in that. We believe that it's actually important that people can also meet locally that are part of these kind of decentralized social networks as well as in the digital realm. And um, these are all aspects of it. I just want to say we need, we, are, we need to really to grow this idea. And, and this is what I'm so grateful for Andreas also to, to have brought us together with Kernel because I felt there's such a match in terms of the, you know, that there's people with a very similar mindset in a way or with, with, this, with interest that are struggling with the same questions. As we have, because right now, what what happens is, of course, that it's Andreas also said many projects there, are, you know, um, you know, building things and with a very clear goal of let's just get as many users as possible as quickly as possible. And where are they? And wh what are we gonna do in six months? And we have been in the space for a while now, exploring different paths, and um, and as it seems like that it's harder to, to get people excited about this and, and get into this context because it always takes these few slides maybe to explain it, you know, what, what we are actually meaning or where we are getting, getting at in, in, in contrast to, hey, there is a, there's a cool NFT, uh, you can buy it in, in three seconds, uh, something like that, you know. Actually, that first line in that comparison table where mm -hmm. you say, well, it, you know, Web2 is technological and we're focused on socio-technological. It's very easy to just skip past that and think, oh, course, socio-technological, it's social networking, course, you know, whatever. But that is so integral to everything that we're about because it says people are in the mix. This is, this is a human thing. This is um, just as the biologists have the, the theory of dual inheritance, where culture and genes co-evolve through informing each other, we are, we are contemplating the co-evolution of social, legal and technical code. They don't, they're not three separate things that just come together in the mix that we you know, roll out in 2023. They necessarily adapt to each other and co-evolve how they can evolve is dependent on the values that we set ourselves and our anticipation for um, understanding how the design choices we make today may affect the outcomes tomorrow, which is which is difficult in complex adaptive systems. But at least there's a, a recognition that the people, the participants, are the coders, by which I mean legal social and technical code. Everybody has to be involved in developing the code. That's how human community has thrived. That's how cooperation has thrived. That's why our species has, has thrived. Um, and if we ignore that continual patterning, then we won't be reproducing ourselves, if you like. Amazing. I, uh, are you sure? Are you sure there's no flaws in there? I'm always open for anyone to 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 to, to come in here with the yeah buts. You know, Philip, the cracks are only there to let the light in, right? So, oh. but uh, <laughs> I, I I do like a few a few uh, a few sort of further things just to extend. It. Like the one is that um, you're quite right when we talk about like 
it is necessary to have both the technology as in the craft, the conversation and the legal understanding all operating in concerts as Martin had on those slides. Uh, and that previous versions of the work that we have been doing have uh, emphasized perhaps the encoding the technology to the detriments of conversation and legality. Uh, but one of the things that you said there really, it just, it sparked a thought in my mind was that, you know, like human conversation is, uh, the, it transfers information at a slothful rate, which is true in some way. Uh, but not entirely, perhaps, the whole truth. And what it reminds me of is a certain kind of rhythmic approach to things. And that's something that I'm very interested in. I, I, I just lay that because I know that lots of people, both like Kokeb and Tina, have many wonderful insights from the natural world about rhythm and cyclicality. Seasonality is how it's often imagined in Web3. But I think that there's something much deeper to be said about rhythm and the transfer of information and healthy community which applies to the ways in which, again, we think about like, what does it mean to integrate different systems? Now, the last thing I'll say before, you know, I just wanted to lay that there for you because I know that you have thoughts to offer us there, uh, is that like, you know, at, at like a, a high level, it's like kind of easy, you know, at a very simplistic, superficial way to imagine how like we might interface, which is that like, like kernel has, uh, like a series of services, one of which is an authentication service and one of which is a storage service. And if people choose to sign into a cacher with their kernel wallet, that will like send a JWT to our auth service, which will speak to our storage service and pass the information associated with that kernel profile to a cacher if the member has chosen to make it public. And like that. That's like the superficial way of, okay, cool. Like, and then you're in a cache and maybe you have like a kernel badge and you can like see other kernel fellows and, and have more context embedded into your first interaction with like the network, right? That, that makes sense and is not that difficult to build. Um, but for me, like a deeper question, because you all are uh, against uh, token economics, given some of the experiments from 2017 to 2020, is uh you know like the the real it's it's fascinating right that like the first instantiation of a cache was all on chain the blockchain is an index and then like my thought there right and it's very speculative is that like what happens if like the interface is economic and on chain between federated communities like 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 do tokens not become much more interesting when they are intercommunal, not intra-communal. Uh, and because that, then, you know, you have a, an ABI, it's sure it's a simple ERC-20 ABI, but it's like fundamentally shared. That's like an interesting, and I just, I just put that out, but Tina, please tell oh, us about rhythm. I, I, love, I love rhythm. <laughs> just a very stimulating conversation, um, in part because, um, it feels like what you're talking about is sort of like we're getting into the intricacies of like defining these spheres of influence, right? That carry with them certain information that is like in, has been inherently uh, proven to one's heart or self-reflective or has gained some kind of value through the process of, of traveling, right? So when we're talking about the kernel badge being useful um, in the environment, it's because it carries with it that kind of internal heat right and um it's just that that intimacy is so critical because it you know like we are within these complex systems already and we're having to almost like find ourselves in the complexity of it so when you're I don't know. I, I know I might not completely be making sense, but like when I hear about you talk about the necessity to have this sort of um, responsive to the existing legal um, framework, part of me says, but wait, but wait, let's talk about natural law. Let's talk about the way things have, have really drifted from the way balance actually works in nature through the rhythms, through the seasons. And I see that what you're talking about is so interesting and so necessary to bring 
those conversations about natural law and the ways that we've evolved to sort of compensate for our lack of balance, that it's those very conversations. Like it's almost like we're having to recognize ourselves as natural beings within a natural law system to have these new conversations about what law really means to us within these very intricate and history rich um, and protected um, conversations and relationships. So um, yeah, and then when we can have those conversations on that intimate level, I think then the rhythm starts to come in and the balance starts to come in and we get to see like how we get to have these blockchain and you know etheric relationships with each other and still be grounded in our in our gardens and in our in our homes and i hope that made sense so it, it just completely makes sense uh, and I, I just Tina, just to add to this uh okay we are like a little bit uh, um you know hackers in the sense of the legal system um because the beauty of the idea here was that uh by using not one of those hyper economic uh models yeah like a, a limited liability company or even a, a co-op just actually not so hyper economic maybe but still you know uh you you can actually do anything uh and you can do any patterns and, and movements in the association because the, the the legal code is so slim that it allows you a lot of freedom in in, in f exploring things that are not bound to any financial rewards for example so that's 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 why we might we might explore it this way, you know. Ah, oh, yeah, uh, Charles. You so, have a... Super quick. I, I have to jump to another call, but this is great, sure. and I, I'm sorry I have to go. I'm just curious because I'm here in Switzerland. What, where are you thinking for association? Because this is one of the one of those places, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Switzerland. So yeah, okay. Z Z uh, Z Zurich, for instance, is probably the, the the location that we would choose, and. And the, the, the Swiss Association is a, a model that is used by all kinds of beautiful organizations. You know, the Gold Traders Ring, uh, the uh, Red Cross, but but also uh, the FIFA, yeah. FIFA, yeah, FIFA. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, government organizations. I'm here in the center of Zurich. So anyway, um, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll pick it up. Much yeah. love. Okay. Uh, Tina, I just wanted to say that I loved to, uh, I loved what you had to say and. It resonates so deeply and I was contrasting how you were putting it with how Andy in his uh, last contribution here was talking about uh, plugging in the kernel wallet and the unprofiling to Ethereum world which was at a more immediate and technical level but and how then actually to a certain extent and Andy I mean this in the right way that was that's the right thing to do but only in the short term it's it's the next step, but we all sense on this call that it's it's not good enough. We know that uh, just to bang on about identity, because I work a lot in the identity. As you were talking, Tina, I was trying to see what you were saying through my lens. Perhaps I shouldn't. I should have tried to see it through your lens. That's a discipline I have to work on. But I was I was thinking that exchange that 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 information flux is integral to identity as a sense-making and a meaning-making meaning -making capacity, not as some kind of public Ethereum address, which it sits there and is immutable and I own. Uh, that, that, that mechanistic application of distributed ledger does not correspond to the way you just described how you see things. And so we have to do what Andy says in the short term, knowing that that's not good enough. And we have to introduce more dynamism, more generativity, more um, focus on the edge rather than the nodes. Some more a greater plurality, diversity, basically just taking all the clues from our understanding of, of, of natural systems that we don't see when we look at the blockchain. And that does describe a kind of an evolution, right? So it's like, it's almost like embracing the, the mutability, but also the reflective quality. So like you're constantly taking feedback loops, you're constantly re, re 
readjusting to the season, readjusting to the place, readjusting to the time, and readjusting to the people who are involved. So like working- We didn't even practice. start to share with you the ideas of the working groups and how the governance of this should look like, actually. Sweet. Uh, we, should, we should have a session on that, okay, yeah. We absolutely can. We have a number of these. They will be taking place at this time each week for the Summer of Love uh, and are all on the Convo link, which I will make sure to share each week just to keep us up to date. Um, yeah, Hazel, thank you so much. And thank you so much to everybody. I, uh, I know that we're a little bit over. Um, have I have 10 minutes, but so if there are like further comments or anything, now is the time. Uh, otherwise, we can come back again next week. Uh, please, there's space and time if you would like anything else on your mind before we close our discussion for the day. I could just take it one step further, but I don't want to hog it if anyone else would like to, 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 to go with what's on their minds. In that case, um, I, I, I would, if I may, which is to, uh, Martin was good enough to share a link to module four self-inquiry, which is, I've just posted the link in, in here. Yes. And uh, I was, uh, I, I mean, the fact that uh, you reference uh, Kai Krugler's work, already got me excited because I love, I don't agree with everything in that essay, but I love uh, uh, the way she laid things out. And this one web page was the, was where I immediately finally, call me a slow learner, but I immediately got the sense that Colonel is very much about the human, and humanity first and foremost. And uh, I don't know why it took me until I got to this web page, but thanks Martin for, for sharing it with me. And, and then as I've, as I've read it, I've become uh, excited about the potential to collaborate on reframing identity in a digitalized world. Uh, so I, I, um, I don't think digital identity as a phrase does humanity justice? But the alternative phrase I've come up with is a bit of a mouthful, and that is the the um, digital mediation and augmentation of human identity. You know, keeping the word human in there just to remind ourselves that we're talking about the way identity as a sense making capacity works naturally in the world. Um, and so, when I've been looking at all of the digital identity approaches, whether they are you know, access control lists and authentication processes of, you know, 40, 50 years ago, all the way up to cryptographic schema like self-sovereign identity. They're all very much grounded in the bureaucracy, the bureaucratization of identity, rendering the human sensible to the system, um, putting graph connection ahead of human connection, uh, stability ahead of, of uh, you know, something being dynamic, temporary, multiple, organic, if you like. It's very difficult to find the words because identity can mean so many different things to different people in different contexts. Uh, so for want of a, uh, a way of describing, uh, having a shorthand, a label for where we think we should go to, we've come up with the phrase generative identity, which effectively means how do we digitalize human identity such that we put psychological, sociological, and ecological health first and foremost. In other words, don't prove digital identity just so that you can prove you're 18 at the bar and buy a beer or to ease the process of hiring a car. You know, these are very process oriented approaches. And yeah, they're painful. And wouldn't we all love if things were a bit more efficient and, you know, through the magic of crypto, um, we can exchange verifiable credentials. And before you know it, because that system is frictionless, that approach to identity seeps into all of the micro interactions, the micro transactions in day-to-day -day life and saps the lifeblood 
out of human relations and, and, and the ability to learn to trust each other and to, and to go through the process of knowing. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm just excited to read that web page because as I'm going through it, I can sense um, the same angst or the same, no, angst, that's negative, the same hope uh, that we can do better. The word is yearning. Yeah. Yearning, that's a good one. There is, a, a, it's, it's astonishing though how, how homogenous the current digital identity community is. And there's so, uh, in their own echo chamber that some of them confuse their point on the journey with the destination. And, and, it, and it's, it's so very far from. And no matter how I look at the, you know, the, the the, the kernel vision or the Akasha vision, I keep coming back to this question of digitally augmenting the human, making effectively cyborgs of, of all of us in a good way, not in the Star Trek Borg sort of way. Um, uh, how important this design for the digitalization of human identity is, if only to challenge the the, the thousands of engineer days that go into everyday digital identity as it's currently conceived and it's not it's not it's not it's not looking good the way it's it's shaping up at the moment so it's cool stuff so i just wanted to to say how again i know andy i might have said i'm a little bit excited about identity and our last call but i just couldn't help mentioning it again <laughs> it's wonderful thank you so much truly uh you will know that uh, at the top of that particular web page is a quote from a man called Crazy Cloud, an old Zen monk from 13th century Japan, otherwise known as Ikiyu, says, no masters, only you, the master is you. Wonderful, no. <laughs> and one of my favorite little Zen excerpts. And one thing I will say here is that identity also means one. <laughs> and if you look deeply into all of the explorations, whether they are technological, i.e. we were already cyborgs the first time uh, orangutan picked up a stick to poke into an ant's nest in a tree, one recognizes that the yearning, the exploration of self is the same Atman Brahman whatever you want to call it, right? That recognition of identity, self-knowledge, you know your identity, your oneness, all things. There's a, a purpose for connecting. <laughs> and, have you, and have you seen any uh, lines of uh, software code that live up to that yet? Only in my dreams. <laughs> <laughs> And it's such a strange language, you know. <laughs> it, it, it is, I mean, one of the, the kickbacks I get from the self-sovereign identity community is, um, well, where's your code? Um, like the only way that you can critique extent work is by having an, another something already, already done. Um, I don't think. Can I? <laughs> okay. Yeah. So a lot of my work gets done at night, right? And I'll wake up in the morning and it's like full blown. And I'm like, just sitting there disseminate, like disseminating to myself. Like it's, so I'm sure that we all have that experience. <laughs> but um, I've been thinking lately and you just keyed into this so beautifully, like, okay. So this, this, this uh, screen side of us, right? It's, it's like, okay, so if, if we have this etheric soul self that is <laughs> in a grander but more etheric realm okay let's just do that as a as a precept I, i'm not claiming it to be anything more than that right now but like we're the last to know as human beings like we're the last to know what our soul self or our deeper selves already know so it's just funny and humorous that this screen self is the self that is the last to know. <laughs> so if we're like treating our, our environments like 
they're already pre-centered. They're already pre-centered in a place or in a time or in a relationship. And that this is the, this is the last to know. And that, that it's like, we're gifting, we're gifting, we're, we're not looking to that as source. We're not looking to this as source. We're not looking to our code as source. We're actually looking to our code as being the expression of the source that is already expressive of our our higher beings. Anyway, do you know Do you know Nora Bates? No, I, I, I don't know if you've ever come across Nora. Uh, she's well. The reason I mention her is because, as you were saying those words, I was thinking Nora could be saying those words. She's the daughter of Gregory Bates, and who. Uh, was a very influential ecologist and cybernetician and well basically massive brain um, and uh, she is leading the Bateson Institute and is basically exploring uh, his work and keeping his work alive it's particularly around the ecology of mind and uh, she's running with a concept called warm data which is very much a, around um, distinguishing it from cold data, which I think actually the, the, the adjectives are suitable because I hardly need to explain already. As soon as I say today's databases have got cold data in them, then I know that people on this call will already get a feel for, for what warm data means. It's contextual. It's a, it demands greater information and a perspective to be brought to it in order for it to be meaningful in that particular community, in that particular ecology. Um, so yeah, I, I um, I, yeah, check out um, Nora uh, Bateson. Uh, she, uh, her last book was written in, in, in prose um, and it's just delightful. Thank you all so much. Super. Thank you very much for your time, for your kind attention, for your dreams and hopes. We will be back uh, on Thursday, Martin is correct, Thursday next week. Uh, Sweet. 10 a.m. Thank you. Lovely to meet you all. Thank you all. It was amazing discussion. So much to digest. I yeah. I'll probably watch the, the recording again if you can share with us, Andy. It was so, oh. so deep. Yeah. Hold on. Oh well. Great. See you all next week. See you. See you. Take care.